Hey, I'm Lorelei Siemens and welcome back to our Revelation study. And we are in Revelation chapter 20. So we are almost at the end of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20 is a very difficult chapter. And it is one that a lot of people um, avoid it and they try to take things out that are in this book, uh, in this chapter. And there's a lot of controversy about this chapter in the Bible. So we're going to try to break it down the best we can. But really remember, the point of this Bible study is just to prepare you for what you are going to see when you jump in and you read it for yourself. Because that is my goal, just to have you reading the book of Revelation without fear. Before we can jump into Revelation chapter 20, let's do a quick review on what happened up to this point. So we have the beginning, we're talking about the churches, and then we have, you can remember, um, the seals, we have the seven seals. The seventh seal starts off with the, um, begins our trumpets, and then we have our seven trumpets, and then we have, after seven trumpet, is our um, bowls of judgment. And we are introduced to the Antichrist, we are introduced um, to um, the woman, we're introduced to the prophet, we learn more about Satan, who's the dragon, so we have some of these main characters, the two witnesses, those are all introduced and explained throughout um, the middle of the book of Revelation. And But remember when the bowls are poured out, those are the final judgments, and that those are really an example of what hell is going to be like. And at the end, the very final bowl that comes out is uh, Babylon is uh, completely destroyed and the Antichrist is destroyed. And so now we are starting here at chapter 20. So it starts right off. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So that's really important. So it starts off here right at the very beginning is that um, Satan is taken and he is bound up and chained up for a thousand years. And what happens after that is, uh, look at from verse four, uh, verse four, verse five, and verse six, we learn about the kingdom. And the kingdom is going to be a thousand years where Jesus comes here to earth and reigns for a thousand years. And everything is amazing and perfect. And it's like living in the Garden of Eden again. Now there's not a lot of verses about this here, uh, but throughout the Old Testament, the kingdom is talked about quite often. So when you hear verses such as they're going to um, take their swords and beat them into plowshares because there's going to be no reason for them because there's going to be no war, no killing, that's talking about this time period, the kingdom age. And we learn about things such as uh, the lion and the lamb are going to lie down together. This is this age, the kingdom age. So it's a perfect time period where people will live really, really long time. Uh, it says that the very youngest person will live to be 100 years old. So that, that would be dying young if you die at 100. So it's just gonna be this time where people live really long lives and there's no war and there's no diseases and, uh, and Jesus is ruling. Now, who is going to be living during this kingdom age? Um, those who survive the tribulation and aren't killed because they aren't, they didn't follow the beast, they don't have the mark of the beast, so they continue to live, they'll be living during the kingdom age. But other people who've been martyred or who have died before the church, we come back and we rule with Jesus. So we will be ruling, we will be the kings and the queens um, or the governors or the prime ministers or presidents or mayors, all that stuff, we will be ruling and then people who survive will be living there. But if you could think in a thousand years, how many children will be born? So those of us who um, were either raptured and come back or who died and come back, we won't be having children. But the people who survived the tribulation will be having children. And so you think um, a thousand years and the youngest you, you can die is a hundred. So think about how many children that you will have. So within a thousand years, the earth is populated again. And then at the end of the thousand years, Satan is unchained and he's able to come back and deceive the world again. And so he once again comes to those who um, were born during this time period and he begins to do the same thing he's done all along, right? He wants you to doubt God. He wants you to not have faith in him. And those who don't have faith on him will end up coming 
against God and making war against um, Jesus and trying to overthrow him. Now, before we jump to that part, I just want to talk for a little bit here about the kingdom age, those thousand years. So there's a couple of different views on um, the kingdom age. So there's some different terms that you could hear. So one is an amillennialist, and they really don't believe in the, um, there's no earthly reign of Christ. So there's no time when Jesus is going to come here and live and rule. Uh, I see that pretty clearly here. And so personally, I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus really will literally rule here on earth. Um, there's the post-millennialist. So these are people who believe um, the whole world comes, becomes Christian for a thousand years before Christ returns. And then there's a the premillennialist, which means that Jesus returns and then sets up a literal reign for a thousand years. I personally uh, believe in premillennial because I try to take the Bible as literally as possible whenever I can. And when I look at this, especially chapter 20, it kind of seems to me that that would fall under the premillennial view. Um, I guess we'll find out who's right when we get there. But, okay, so as the thousand years come to an end, uh, Satan is released and he's able to go and deceive people again. So he deceives them the same way he has all the way through history. And um, if you think as... In the Old Testament, in order to have your sins forgiven, you had to have faith in what was going to happen in the future. You had to have faith. That's what, um, when they were sacrificing the animals, that's what they were doing. They were The lamb was an example of what was going to happen, that God was going to send the perfect lamb that would be able to take away our sins. So in the Old Testament, they're looking forward with faith to what was going to happen. And in the New Testament, we were looking back. We were looking at what Jesus did. And we are trusting that what he did on the cross, that he was the perfect lamb and that he took the punishment for our sins. But it is faith. We are looking at that through faith. Now, during this millennial time, it'll be faith once again. They will have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. It's the same thing all the way along. So imagine that you're living in this time period. You were born during this a thousand years perfect world. And you are told, listen, the world didn't used to be like this. There used to be time when animals would just kill each other and you couldn't just play with the lamb. And there was wars and people would try to describe the wars and what wars were like, but you've never lived through any of that. Everything has always been perfect. And so your Satan comes to you and he tempts you. Do you really want to believe this? Is this really true? You really think this person, Jesus, who's leading the world, you really think that he's God and you really think the world used to be that horrible, what they're saying? You really think it was that bad? Like you really think people just killed each other and that countries would send these little, these things that would land and they would just blow up and kill all these people. You really think that is true? And, and you really believe that they're um, that that Jesus came down here during all of that and made himself a person and then uh, and then died on a cross. You really think that people actually did that to other people that would put nails in them and nail them? You really believe that, that, that people aren't like that. People aren't bad like that. That's a totally made up story. Nobody would ever live that way. So if you're looking in the kingdom age and you're trying to describe the world that we live in today, it would be pretty unbelievable. And so there are people who will say, no, I don't believe this story. I don't believe that this is true. And they are going to follow Satan. And so it says here um, that they're going to come with the nations. When we see the nations, that means the Gentiles. That's another word usually for the Gentiles. So it'll be the Gentile people coming, which means it probably won't be any Jewish people who are going to go against Jesus during this time period. So that it says here too that we Gog and Magog. So there's a bunch of different views on Gog and Magog. Um, some people believe Gog is a person who comes from a place called Magog. So it'll be like a, a new version of the Antichrist maybe. Um, most people put Gog and Magog as like Russia, um, China type area over there. And there's also the idea that um, Gog and Magog are going to, and this is in Ezekiel, but there's another war with Gog and Magog, which some people actually put that Ezekiel war at this time period as well, saying that it's the same one. Other people say that Gog and Magog, that war is going to come before the rapture. And so that people, when they're saying this, they're just saying it's like that. You know, it's like when people say someone is literally Hitler. We don't 
which is, I hate people use the word literally there because it's so bad, but when someone holds the same views as him and then they kind of put him in the same category. So we don't know, is Gog and Magog a person? Is Gog and Magog countries that come? Or is it just a representation of an example of a belief system? But they come, they come against God to fight against him. And you have to think too, like they've not had any war. They've not experienced any war ever. And there's no weapons, right? Because all the swords have been beaten to plowshares. So they all come, every single one who is against God, they all come, they march on Jerusalem to overthrow God. But I have to wonder what they have. They're not going to have guns. They're not going to even have swords unless they go out and build some more swords maybe. But um, they're going to, it's rocks. I don't know. But they come up against God and then fire comes from heaven and destroys them. So it's not really a war but they're wiped out. And then after that, um, the Satan is then sent directly to hell, locked up forever. So he had, he was chained up for a thousand years and then brought back, but now he is gone forever. And then we have the great white throne judgment. And so the first half of chapter 20, there's a lot of people who try to get rid of the kingdom, say that that doesn't actually happen. Some people say we're living in the kingdom now. Uh, uh, it's, there's a lot of death happening around me right now. Uh, a lot of horrible things every time you turn on the news. So this isn't very much anything like what the kingdom is described of. So I don't know how anyone can follow that. Um, there is another thing people will say, uh, like we are the kingdom. So like the kingdom is in our hearts. So all that peace and everything is in our hearts. Now there's two ways to look at this. Because sometimes when people say we are the kingdom, um, they aren't meaning that we're the literal kingdom. Like they still, I, I believe we are the kingdom and I also believe in that thousand year kingdom. And I'll explain to you right now why that is. Because if I, if, if there was a king and the king said, um, I'm the king over this kingdom. And he had uh, a palace and he had a city and he had walls but there's no people living in there. It was empty. So he's not really a king of anything, right? Because in order to have a kingdom, you have to have people living in the kingdom. So we know that we are going to be in the kingdom. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you will be in the kingdom. So yes, you are the kingdom in the sense that you will be the people who are there in the kingdom. So it says that God is building his kingdom. He is. He's been building his kingdom. The whole Bible, the whole Bible, the whole history of civilization, he is building his kingdom, which is the people who will be there during the literal thousand years. But some people believe, yes, he's building the kingdom, but there is no thousand years. So you're going to get a lot. There's a lot of different views on the kingdom. So if you start researching it, you're going to hear a lot of things. My suggestion is to dive in read it, pray, ask God to show you things in it, and um, and then take it as literally as you possibly can. So the first half of chapter 20, a lot of things are taken out. People don't want to believe it. People don't want to, I don't know why though. Why would you not want to believe in the thousand years kingdom? Because that's kind of awesome. However, from verse 11 to verse 15 in chapter 20, is very very difficult part of the Bible and it's a part of the Bible that a lot of people kind of wish wasn't there we wish we could take it away um, because it is really hard and it's not something and there are people preachers who there's some preachers who won't preach on it at all and there's other preachers who try to say that it's not real because they don't want it to be real but what is described in from 11 to 15 is hell. So we're going to talk about hell a little bit, even though that's not something that I love to talk about at all because it's kind of horrible. So I want to start by saying hell is the most avoidable place ever. It's not created for you. You're not supposed to go there. God doesn't want you to go there and it's easily avoidable. The next thing that I want to say is that God created a world with no death. It was man that created a world with death. When we chose to do things our way instead of God's way and death came into the world, 
Death came into the world through sin, and that was not God's intention. All right, so as we look at the beginning of the great white throne judgment, uh, it says that those who that the dead are going to actually be raised back up so that they can face the judgment. So these are actual bodies that are going to be resurrected. It says they're going to come up from the sea, they're going to come from the graves, they're going to come and they're going to stand before God in this great white throne judgment. So there's two different books that are opened that in this judgment. So the first one is um, the books of deeds. Now when we look at the books of deeds, this is plural because there is so much, right? All of the things that we have done. So one of the things I hear most often when I talk to people about heaven and about hell is, you know what, I think when I reach God, that he's gonna look at all the good things I've done, look at all the bad things I've done, and as long as I've done you know, more good things than bad things, then uh, I'll be able to get to heaven. But stop and think for a minute. You think that's a loving God? That's so cruel to live your whole life not knowing what's gonna happen, not knowing if you're gonna be in heaven or hell. That's not loving and saying it's up to you. Be really, really good. Maybe you'll make it. That's not loving at all. What God did was was loving because he said it does, you can't. If you try really, really hard, you can't. You, that, that's impossible. But what I am going to do is that I am going to come here to earth. Jesus is God. So I'm going to come to earth. I'm going to take your punishment. And so all you have to do is just sign in. Just say, yep, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you really were God's son. And I am sorry for my sin. And I am trusting you. That's it. And he writes your name down in the book. And so for me, that's a choice that I made. So I know when I stand before God, it will simply be him looking, seeing my name and done. And I know where my eternal, my, where my eternity is going to be. And so when we are reading here through chapter 20, we see that those whose names are not written in the book of life are cast into a lake of fire. And that's horrible to think about. Especially for me, I know people who I care about who died and I know that they didn't believe in Jesus. And I know that that wasn't, um, that they were for sure not Christians. They had rejected, they had personally rejected Jesus. And so when I think about this time period, I feel, I feel really sad. And I think, you know, I, I wish I could just erase that. We believe, hell doesn't exist based on whether we believe in him or not. Just like heaven doesn't exist whether you believe in it or not. And so for people to say, well, I'm going to reject the idea of hell because I don't like that part of Christianity. If you think that it's up to you whether hell is real or not, then you maybe are putting yourself in thinking that you're equal with God, which is how Satan got kicked out of heaven in the first place. So you believing in hell or not believing in hell doesn't really make a difference as to whether it's real or not. Um, I know like my, sometimes you watch these little kid movies with fairies and, and people stop believing in them so they start becoming invisible and you get to, you people to believe in them so that they'll be real again. That's, you know, that's little kids books. In reality, whether you believe in something or don't believe in something doesn't make it real or false. So me believing in hell doesn't make it real and me not believing in hell doesn't make it not real. Either it is or it isn't. So some people say, uh, we shouldn't talk about hell. And some of the reasons they do, they say that is like, well, it turns people away from reading the Bible or that turns people away from God. And I, to that, I would say, well, I feel like God is smarter than me and he put it in the Bible. So he wants people to know about it. And maybe the reason he wants people to know about it is so that they will avoid it. Remember, God didn't create hell for people. The Bible says he is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell because he loves us. He loves us so much. He loves us so much that he said, hey, I, I will be the sacrifice. I will be the perfect lamb. I will take all of the punishment for sin so that you don't have to face this. He doesn't want. What happens here in Revelation chapter 20, he, God doesn't want that to happen to any person. He definitely does not want this to happen to you if you're listening to this. This isn't for you. This was supposed to be just for Satan. But if you choose to go there, he's not going to stop you. And that's the thing too. People say, well, God, God sends people to hell and that's not very loving. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He just lets them go there if that's what they choose. 
God doesn't want anyone to go there, but he says, if that's where you really want to go, then okay, that's your choice. I'm not going to force you to not go there. So anyone in hell is not sent there by God. Anyone in hell is there because they chose to be there when they rejected God. The other thing people say, well, we shouldn't talk about hell because then people just become a Christian to avoid hell. And that's fire insurance. And we don't want that. Well, if learning about hell makes you stop and say, whoa, actually, I need to fix this. I need to figure out a way to fix this. And you turn to God and you confess your sins to him. And you say, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus. I am, I am not going to hell. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says if you choose to follow Jesus because you are rejecting hell, that you aren't going to be a Christian. Now, if you say, I'm going to say this little prayer, and then I'm going to go ahead and live my life exactly as possible as I was before, and um, I don't really care at all about Jesus or any of that stuff, but I'm just going to say this prayer just in case hell is real. Well, that's not being a Christian. But that doesn't mean that we avoid talking about hell just in case somebody might do that. The truth is hell is something you want to avoid. So you should probably look into finding out if there's a way for you to avoid that. And the Bible has a really clear way of how to avoid that. And that is by following Jesus Christ. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the end. The other thing people say when they ask about hell is, well, what about people who've never heard? And that doesn't seem very fair if they don't know at all how to become a Christian and then God's going to throw them in a lake of fire and they didn't even know in the first place. That's not very fair. So there's two things about that. One, we have to remember that we are not going to be the one at the judgment that day. Jesus is going to be the one at the judgment that day, and he will do everything fair. So some people argue and say, well, maybe people who haven't heard aren't going to go to hell. And some people say, well, no, because God will have found a way for them to have heard. It doesn't matter because you're not going to be the judge. All we know is that God is going to be fair. So however way God sorts out people who haven't heard the gospel, it will be fair. Now, maybe he's telling you to go tell people who've never heard. So maybe you should go do that. Maybe that is his way of making sure that everyone is heard. The second thing I say when people say that, is I say, well, we know that's not you, right? I mean, if you're watching this video, then you have access to the internet, which means you have access to the Bible because the Bible is on the internet. So that's not you you're not going to be one of the people who haven't heard. So when people face the judgment, and if that's you one day facing the judgment, you're for sure not going to be able to say that you'd never heard. So you should probably look into that. All right. As you read through the Revelation chapter 20, there's a couple of things I want you to think about. One, make sure that you know your destiny. We are all going to die someday. So tomorrow we're going to talk more about heaven but you need to make sure that you know your destiny. Two, you need to witness to the people who you love. You need to make sure that they know their destiny. And then you need to tell the world because this is something, remember, it's the most avoidable place. People just need to know how to avoid it and to know that when they go, if they are on their way to hell, that that is the choice that they are making. John 3, 16, it's the easiest verse ever. Everyone memorizes it from a child, but it's such an amazing verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, which is what's happening here in Revelation chapter 20, will not perish, but will have everlasting life, which we're going to learn about in Revelation 21. All right, so I'm just going to end this chapter before you stop and go through and read this and just try to as simply as possible explain salvation. Because the thing is, it is really easy. It's not complicated. God doesn't say, try your hardest or be really good. He doesn't call for you to go out and do specific things. His way is so easy that no one will be able to stand at that white throne judgment and say, well, God, you made it too hard. It was too hard for me. I couldn't do it because he makes it so easy that I was five years old. I was just a small child. And yet, and I've met people who are in their 80s and 90s. I've met people of all ages, all races, men, women, boys, and girls. It's so easy. For us, it's easy. For Jesus, it was not easy. But it starts this way. First of all, you have to realize that you have a problem. 
You are a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It means none of us are as good as God that we've sinned. And sin is um, doing things our way instead of doing things God's way. It's pretty simple. And all of us have sinned. In fact, I bet it wouldn't take you very long to think of at least one thing you've done already today. So believe, so understand that we are sinners and that you can't get to heaven on your own, that you are stuck, that you have a problem. That's the first thing. The second thing is just believing in Jesus, believing in him. I don't know why anybody would reject Jesus. I mean, I could see people rejecting Christians because we're just people, we're not perfect. And there's a lot of Christians who make a lot of mistakes. And I could see people saying, I'm rejecting, that I don't want anything to do with Christianity because I've seen Christians. But look at Jesus. Why would anybody reject Jesus? Even people who are atheists look at who Jesus is and say, yeah, okay, the, Jesus was a pretty good guy. I have to go with that. I can't really find anything wrong with Jesus. So believing in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. Jesus said that he was God. And he said it and he proved it. And that he can forgive your sins. And then you just call out to him and you just ask him. You just tell him that you're a sinner. You tell him that you believe in him. You ask him to forgive your sins. And you ask him to let him let you be a child of God. And he always says yes. There's no magic words. There's no certain sentence that you have to say. Because God sees your heart. And so with your heart, Call out to him and with your mouth, confess that Jesus is God. I'm Laura Lee Siemens. This was Revelation chapter 20. It's a difficult chapter. Tomorrow is a much better chapter because we're going to be talking about heaven. All right. For more uh, videos, you can check out my website at lauraleesiemens.com.